All right. Welcome. Welcome. We are just getting ourselves set up. It is lovely to see all your bright, smiley, shiny faces today. I hope no matter where you are, you're having an absolutely beautiful uh, Wednesday, Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, depending on what time zone you are in. Um, I am so excited to do this one. Okay. So we launched, we did um, nine fiddle errors yesterday for, for a another group. Um, sometimes we'll have teams that will come to us and they will often ask us, you know, is it possible for, for you to do a presentation just for our association, just for our company? And I say, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're always more than happy to do that. So I hosted the event yesterday and there were so many questions about, yes, Kim, this makes absolute a lot of sense. Um, but what about now? Like, what about, you know, this was great in BC before COVID. Um, what about today? You know, now that, uh, you know, maybe social distancing isn't as common or anything, but um, what we're starting to open up, but is it really still the same? So I am so excited because what I did was I created the nine fatal errors market leaders don't make the COVID edition. Whoa. So some of our things are completely brand new. Some of the things are um, completely just revised and updated specifically for the times that we are in right now. Um, but I am super excited to help you get started on this. So we're going to have the doorbell probably ring a couple more times as a few more participants come through. Um, for those of you that are watching this on Zoom, the chat is open. Go ahead and post your questions and everything. Uh, if I have time at the very end, which I'm hoping to try to reserve somewhere around five to 10 minutes at the very end for any questions that you may have. But don't wait until the very end. Go ahead and post your question ahead of time so that we can get some of your feedback. Now, um, the chat is open as well because one of the best things about webinars is how do we create it more interactive. When we teach this as classrooms, it's great because I have everybody's uh, face on there and I can actually stop and I can say, hey, Ryan, hey, Brianna, hey, Dale, like, what are your thoughts on this? In a webinar format, we don't quite get that same interactivity. So I will ask you to please have your chat open because I am going to ask you some questions. I want to hear your feedback as we go forward. So I always start off with a true story and nine fatal errors. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to update the version because it has been a couple years since we have updated it. I used to talk about an engineering firm, but I want to tell you a very specific story about a company that went ahead in um, at around March. We were actually in talks around February uh, to get them involved in the program. They're a digital marketing company. They specialize in a lot of social media, but they'll also do websites. They do advertising. Advertising. They do all sorts of different types of things. Most of the, those things will be outsourced, like such as the, um, the ad campaigns or some of the, um, the specific graphic design, but a lot of it they will do in-house. And so we have been talking about really getting them started on a sales process because one of the things that they were afraid of was, Kim, we have four really large companies. If we lost any one of them, like things would go really bad. Now, life has interesting ways of showing us the things that uh, sometimes we want to see, sometimes we don't want to see, but almost overnight, on March 17th, um, we're here in Alberta, that was kind of the day when everything hit the fan. Uh, March 16th, March 17th, when every company was like, you're all working from home. It is like, we're not having anybody go in. Uh, places like New York did that around the same time uh, where we are. This is definitely what happened. And they said... Oh my goodness, like overnight, we lost all of our business. 80% of their business was completely lost. That entire week, they were having to deal with phone call after phone call of companies saying, we need to cancel our contract. We need to stop. We cannot afford to spend, um, invest with you anymore. They had built majority of their business through referrals. And they, at this point, they had been felt lucky enough to not need a sales process. Part of the reason why we're in this conversation, but they're like, we don't even know if this is the right time to invest. And the biggest thing they told me at that time was, Kim, I can't go bankrupt. Whatever you do, we cannot go bankrupt. Will you work with us? Will you help us? Now, the interesting thing is when I've told this story previously, the fatal errors are the same, and then they're the same, and they're the same. But I want to help you out with what we did with them, and I'm going to tell you what ended up happening with them because they did decide to invest at the end of April. But let's go ahead. 
So my personal sales background, I actually have um, over 10 years of sales experience. I had worked uh, for a lot of companies that maybe you recognize, maybe some of you but don't. I started off working for Xerox. Um, Xerox at the time was known for having the very best sales training that you could ever possibly imagine. And I started in 2006, back when the, we used to joke around that the roads were paved with goals. They're like, there must be something with where you live because I think the government is like wanting to pave the roads with gold. You have so much money there. It was, I'm going to be honest with you. It was pretty easy to make some sales back then. And then almost overnight, everything changed. The great recession, as we now call it today, in hindsight, that is 2020 is, is today, um, was in 2008, 2009. It was the end of October and the end of September and all of a sudden, I'm listening to the news and I'm like, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have gone bankrupt. And this is the very beginning of the housing bubble crisis, completely obliterating every stock market as you know it. And despite the fact that we weren't dealing with housing markets, we weren't dealing with mortgages, we weren't even dealing with a lot of the things that started to make this bubble crash, every single company and industry felt this ripple effect. Because overnight, every company that I had been working with started to post everything really close to themselves. And they said, we will not go ahead and invest. We don't know where our next dollar is coming from. We don't know where it's coming. We can't invest. Yet, despite all of that, I somehow became rep of the year that year, the number one rep to sell more than anyone else that year. The reason being is because I talked less and I listened more. I found out really what my clients were going through. I'm going to give you more tips on this because this is the fatal error too many companies are making right now. Too many companies are making this error right now. Now, again, right, because we run into these cyclical conversations. Again, in 2005, I was working for another company and almost overnight, the oil and gas industry completely collapsed. Now, this was an industry that was personally affecting my clients. I wasn't dealing in oil and gas, but majority of my clients were. And overnight, the entire revenue stream had shrunk and companies were like, we're not spending. We are not investing right now. We're not going to do anything. And I said, okay, I understand. And we started to understand more about their company and what they were wanting and asked a lot of questions. And very quickly, I also became the top rep that year. I sold more than anyone else in that company. Beyond those two massive industry crashes, and in hindsight, we're going to take a look at what COVID has done for a lot of people's businesses, uh, but we don't have quite the insight yet. We have starting to get that insight. But I had also dealt with companies that had went through bankruptcies, deaths, mass layoffs, all situations which were really sensitive to talk about, yet somehow we were still able to help our clients out and and achieve more. We'll talk more about that um, in a little bit. But after all of that, after 10 years of sales experience, I decided it was time to create my own business because what I saw was that too many entrepreneurs, too many small businesses were passionate about what they were doing but they didn't have the sales process that I was so well trained for over a decade in being able to do that. In times of recession, in times of industry pullback, in times of clients not wanting to spend money, on the best of times, as entrepreneurs, as small business owners, we get anxiety knowing, not knowing where the next dollar is coming from. I don't know who's gonna close. I don't know how much they're going to buy. So what we said was, that's it. We want to give more people relief. We want to give them peace of mind. Because if here it is, July 15th, if you knew with at least 80% certainty how much revenue you were going to be bringing in between now until the end of August, until August 31st, would you take that vacation? Would you go ahead and spend more free time with your family? Would you go ahead and invest in the things that you know you need to invest in and hoping that when you do make that investment, it's not too late? Would you do that? We want to give you that relief. We also want to give you empowerment because too many of us are choosing our clients because they have the two criteria that we're looking for right now. Do they have a pulse? Do they have a valid credit card number? Those are the only things I'm really concerned about. Now, let's be honest. Those are the worst things we should find in terms of criteria for our ideal client. So let's find ways that we can actually empower 
our, our clients. Let's find ways that we can empower ourselves to say, you know what? I am only going to deal with the very best. The very best will pay me a premium price and those are the clients I want to go for. I am only going to look for the cream of the crop because those are the clients that I absolutely want to pull and I want to attract. We are dedicated to entrepreneurs and small businesses in consultative business to business sales. If you are selling an invisible, digital marketing, engineering services, business consulting, project management, HR outsourcing, we are the ones that are going to help you. If you are selling Amazon, business to consumer, you are selling um, transactional deals, anything less than $5,000 as a standard transaction, I hope you find what you need out of today's webinars. Everything beyond this may not apply to you, and that is absolutely okay. Get what you need and carry on. If this speaks to you, I want to help you even further because we're only scratching the surface. But what we truly do is we give a sales process for cash flow predictability. You know what you're going to sell, when you're going to sell it, and for how much. We're giving you a process to get those bigger sales and faster closes. Closes that are going to happen in four weeks, six weeks, no more than two months. Imagine what that would do for you. This is me today. Uh, that is me on the left. I know you're like, who's that other person? She looks familiar. Yeah, that's my best friend, Oprah. She has no idea, but trust me, I know. And that's all that matters. Um, that was actually my opportunity to meet her because of all the, all the wonderful things we've been doing for small business owners, for entrepreneurs just like you. Trust me, Oprah doesn't meet just anybody. So I want you to know that if, uh, if Oprah is willing to stand by me, I'm willing to stand by you. I am LinkedIn's most influential sales leader to follow. I am Success Magazine's most inspirational blogger. That is my third book, Sell More Faster. I am going to give that book away, give it away to a few number of people at the very end of today's call. So stick around till the very end of the webinar. I am also Startup Canada's Female Entrepreneur of the Year. Okay, let's talk about you. Let's talk about these fatal errors. Fatal error number one. I need lots of leads. Okay, so here's the thing. As COVID started to happen and we started to pull back our business, um, a lot of companies were pulling back. There was one of two things. There's kind of two schools of thought I've seen with businesses. Either number one was the I'm too nice. I'm too nice, so I'm not really going to reach out to any clients. And we were so nice. We were so nice that for three months, we said, I'm not going to lead, reach out to any clients. And then come June, it was usually about the end of May, come June, all of a sudden, those people that were so nice said, oh, I, I don't have any money. I don't have any revenue coming through. I, I need to really hit it. Now, I don't know if, it, if you've seen the same thing, but all of a sudden, it felt like overnight, right after the Memorial Day weekend, my inbox in LinkedIn started to go filled. Field. And it didn't matter what time of day it was. And it was like, listen, these are the things I can do for you. Link, 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 link. Don't forget to check me out. Here's a PDF and here's a bunch of other stuff. And it was like they were doing this pray and spray type of approach. I want anybody who has a credit card and a pulse. Who is out there? Somebody's spending money. Somebody's spending money. Who's spending money? I'm going to find them. Oh, I'm exhausted just talking about it. Now imagine putting your energy into trying to find that. This isn't about trying to find lots of leads. It never has been trying to find lots of leads. Unless you are selling a transactional service, unless your entire business is e-commerce, and e-commerce will tell us the math says that only 2%, 2 to 3% of anybody that comes to your website will eventually transact with you. Then yes, you probably need lots of leads. Because if your math tells you that you need to have 100 people to buy and only 2 to 3% of people that are going to show up to your website or are going to buy, then you need somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 hits every single month. Brand new hits every single month to get there. Yeah, sure, you need lots of leads. But for those of us that are in B2B high value services, premium prices, we need quality over quantity. We need the perfect fit. 
We want to be designers of our business. And this is why focusing on your ideal client first and foremost is going to be so valuable. And if it's been a while since you've focused on your ideal client, if it's been a while since you've created that buyer persona for yourself, the buyer persona, including everything from the demographics to the purchasing, the position, the size of the company, the revenue, the amount of employees that they have, but even deeper than that, the person's goals and ambitions, their fears, the things that they're afraid of. What else do we want to get into and an emotional charge for our client? How else are we going to help them? We want to create that, reform it, take a look at it. If it has been more than six months since you've taken a look at your ideal buyer persona, now is the time to look at it and go through those lists of people that you're trying to attract, the people that you are reaching out to and ask, do they even fit my ideal buyer persona. I was working with a company, we were teaching them in their class and the conversations that we were having was about, well, what do we do with this client? What do we do with this client? And one of the people says, you know what? I don't even think they're our ideal client. Like, let's be honest here. Why are we focusing so much on trying to get that client to buy when we don't even, if they buy from us, great. But why are we spending so much energy trying to focus on getting that client to buy when we're okay if they choose not to buy from us? Oh, doesn't that feel good? Now, when you understand who your ideal buyer is, um, and if you're still trying to figure out what that looks like, I mean, give us a call. We'll definitely help you out with that. We have lots of information on figuring out that ideal buyer. Reach out to that person in a LinkedIn direct message with only three to five sentences. Sorry, it should say sentences in there. Three, a three to five sentence direct message. If it is more than five sentences, it is way too long. And then find out if they're interested. But get clear, get focused, get laser attention on that. Fatal error number two. Value is inherently earned. Okay. So one of the things I love is especially if companies have been around for a little while, maybe they've been around for two years, five years, 10 years. I ran into one woman and she said her, she has, her company is six years old and it has never really mm, come over the hump. At six years, she's still feeling very much in start up. She's like, but I have tons of experience, Kim. She goes, I have so much experience. And when I meet somebody for the very first time and all of a sudden we're like nickel and diming, over what services I can provide and what I can't. She's like, I can't understand that. She's like, I want to try to just tell them, listen, I have six years of experience. This is why you should pay me. And I said, that is not what they're paying for. They're not paying you for your experience. Your experience is a bonus. What they're paying for is how your conversation with them is ultimately going to help them achieve so much more. This is the first time that they've had a conversation with an HR outsourcing consultant, an engineering firm, a business consultant, a um, digital marketing agency. They may know kind of what you do, but they've had never had a conversation with you. They might have had conversations with other people in the past. But your conversation with them is the very first time and they want to be feeling taken care of. Don't try to rush through this process because you know what you know. The, the first meeting with a client should never, ever, ever be, let me show you how amazing we are. Let me show you a demo. Let me show you some product samplings. Let me show you all the clients I have worked with in the past. Because all you are doing is you're playing a How I Met Your Mother Naked Man episode. If you've seen the episode, go and watch it. If you haven't, here's the summary. The guy is on a date and the date is not going very well. So what he does he decide? He's like, well, I don't really know if I'm going to get this deal or not. I know she has lots of other prospects out there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bear it all. I'm going to get naked. And one out of three will eventually say yes. Is that how you want to treat your clients? Do you want to say, listen, I don't know if you're going to choose us because I know you have a lot of other options out there. So I'm just going to show it all to you. And you're either going to say, yeah, that's okay. Or you're going to be like, I'm definitely not interested now. I am not really sure what you're trying to do here, but I'm not getting it. Don't go pulling a naked man. No demos in the first meeting. No case studies in the first meeting. No opening up your portfolio and showing people this is how amazing we are. It is not valuable to anybody. When I worked for American Express, I mean, 
mean, they have 150 years of experience and it may have gotten me through that door, but it never once ended up getting me the deal, especially a deal in the first meeting. If anything, I had to work harder for that meal. Slow down. Focus. Focus. What is your intention in this meeting and every subsequent meeting? And here's the other joy. You can still be a premium price. If you create value with your client in these conversations, you can, yes, even in post-COVID, charge a premium price for your services. Because the biggest question you should be asking yourself at the end of every single meeting is would my client have been willing to pay for that meeting? Would they have been willing to pay for that? If the answer is very quickly no, and go ahead and put, me, put this in the chat. I want to hear from you. Is, would you have said, yes, my client would have definitely paid for this? Or like, no, absolutely. My clients would never pay for one of our meetings. Like, there's no, nobody in my industry would ever charge for this. There's no way. Because there is an economics term. It's called opportunity cost. And opportunity cost stands for this. It's, it's that you are given a finite amount of resources, whether that is a dollar, whether that is an hour, whether that is something. We'll take the dollar, for instance. If I give you a dollar, you cannot use that dollar to buy this and this with that same dollar. If, if you have two different items that cost a dollar, you have to make a choice. If I give you an hour, you cannot do multiple things with that hour. Well, yeah, Kim, there's something called multitasking. Yeah, that doesn't actually count because multitasking, you're never 100%. You cannot be 100% focused in that hour on multiple different things. You're 30% focused on this. You're 50% focused on this. You are an additional 20% focused on something else. You cannot be 100% focused on this meeting. And if I'm your client and I have graced you, graced you with an hour of my time. I say, yes, I would love to hear more about your solution. I would love to hear more about it. And in that meeting, you were telling me all about you and how amazing you are. I'm going to walk away and be like, I don't know if that hour was worth it. I could have been doing so much, something so much different than what I spent that hour on. And what that different thing could have been, it, depending on who you're talking to, me as a business owner, what I could have been doing is I could have been making my own sales calls and increasing my revenue. I could have been working on my own processes and decreasing my expenses. I could have been taking time off, which is so personally meaningful to me, to spend time with my three-year-old son. And yet... At that moment, before I met with you, I said, this meeting is the most important thing I have to do in this hour of my time. And you squandered it. You wasted it. Every meeting needs to come back being valuable to the other client. And if you're not sure, if you're sure, but you're not sure, you're not really sure, what can you do? Before you leave your next sales meeting, write this down. I want you to ask your client, was this a valuable use of your time? Did you learn something out of the time that we spent together? What did you take away from this? What, what based on our conversation are you going to do differently? And that is the fastest way to find out if you're creating value for your clients. We want to create even more value and more value for them so that ultimately they understand why they're paying this high price for your amazing service. Okay, fatal error number three. All good meet meetings need to be Zoom meetings. Okay, let's be honest here. We immediately went to this whole online methodology, right? Almost every, overnight, right? Business must go on. And so instead of having face-to-face -face meetings, we just immediately moved everything over to Zoom meetings. Oh, can we talk about Zoom fatigue for a second here, right? Yes, I know the irony of me presenting to you in Zoom, but let's be honest. If you look at my calendar, not every meeting in my calendar is a Zoom meeting. Some of them have started to become face-to-face -face engagements. Some of them are phone meetings. Some of them are Zoom meetings. Your Zoom meeting deserves a time and a place. Do you have something critical to share? Now, you've just learned that you should not have anything critical to share in the very first first meeting. So it doesn't, your first meeting doesn't need to be a Zoom meeting unless somehow you believe it is so critical for you to see my face in that very first meeting. 
save your face to face for after the meeting is qualified. Your very first meeting should just be purely lead qualification. This is your first date coffee date, right? I'm only giving you 45 minutes to find out, is there chemistry? Is there a quick connection? Can we get along at this point in time? We need to get better as salespeople, as entrepreneurs, as business people to, is to say at the very first meeting, this is a yes go or a hell no. We need to get better at going for a quick yes or a quick no, not a, ah, eh, maybe. The problem with going with the, ah, eh, maybe is that we end up wasting time. Imagine going on a first date. Okay. Imagine if you will, for some of you, they're like, oh my goodness, Kim, it has been decades since I've been on a first date. I know, I know. But imagine for a moment that you are on a first date and now you're on this first date and the person comes in, right? Yeah. They look pretty attractive. And they said, thank you so much. I'm so excited to, to meet with you. I'm so excited to meet you. Let me tell you how amazing I am. And blah, 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 blah. They tell you all about their previous relationships, all about all the people that they had dated in the past, the people they consider to date, but they hadn't dated yet. Um, how amazing they were with scholarships and varsity and their, their SAT scores and that, that. And you're just like, you're bored out of your mind. You're checking your watch. And then you're like, uh-huh, this sounds great. And then like, okay, well, this is fantastic. When can we go on another date again? Number one, I didn't even need that to be a date. You could have actually sent that to me as like a couple texts. And I'd be like, you're literally not interested in me. But number two, this isn't about trying to convince the client to say, yes, I want to work with you. This is about you. This is the empowerment portion. This is about you saying, is this person even right for my business? Are we going to be able to serve this client to the highest level, to the biggest degree? I need to find out more about them. I need to find out more about their goals, about their aspirations, about the people that are going to be involved in this decision. Why now? Why are we even talking about this right now? When do they want to see this completed? How would we know that this is a perfect fit for us? and use the questions and their answers to help lead qualify yourself. We go through a whole section specifically around lead qualification. I think we might even have a webinar coming up specifically around how to lead qualify. So if you're not following us on our LinkedIn um, business page, the KO Advantage business page, we'll be listing all sorts of different webinars over the course of the summer. We're doing webinar Wednesday, a brand new webinar every single week. Because your buyer is on your own, their own journey. Your buyer has to understand how will this fit for my business. So this is, this is a very reciprocal type of relationship. As much as we're interested in finding out, is this the right fit for me? Our buyer is also wondering, is this the right fit for me? And it is fair for us to come in and respect the process of what they want, of what they're looking for. We should feel free to ask questions about how they will make their decision, not necessarily what the decision they're going to make. How will you know that this is the right solution for you? How will you prioritize what the right solution is? When you're looking at a different solution, what are the main criteria that you're looking for to know that this is the right thing? And be with them. Too many sales processes I see are trying to force you to get to the very end of a marathon. If you've ever ran a marathon, let's be honest, you can prepare and you can plan. I ran a marathon back in 2014 and I spent months, months preparing for it. I did my speed test. I ran and I ran and I found partners and I found all these people that I ran together with. And despite my best intentions, it took me a lot longer to get to the end of that path than I would have imagined. And I ran with someone who helped to move me along. My coach was standing at the very end of the finish line saying, come on, Kim, you can do it. But the person that I remember the most was the one who ran beside me the entire time. If you are going to run a marathon with your prospect, run with them. Don't try to get them to the very end of the finish line. Because your sales cycle should align 
with where your buyer is in the process. Where is your buyer? This is where you are. Where is your buyer? This is where you are. We don't just show a sales cycle without talking about the other side of the business. Some of you are probably taking screenshots of this. I love this. I love this. Um, let me know at the very end of the call. We'll actually even send you the full PDF version of this so that you actually have it uh, available to yourself. You're not having to look at a JPEG screenshot, um, but that, whatever, whatever floats your boat. We want to make sure you're lead qualified, value creating, and then proposal. Look at that proposal one. I want you to take a, a second just to stare at that one because what it says at the proposal stage is that nothing new should be presented. Nothing new should be presented. Yet too many sales processes out there, too many of us that are involved in our own sales processes will try to jump to proposal and the client hasn't even had a conversation with us about the price. Imagine going on a test drive with a car. You have no idea what that car is going to cost. And they are test driving you. They're like, this is awesome. You're like, yeah, this is amazing. Is this something you'd want to own? You're like, of course, this is something what you're wanting to own. You're like, awesome, awesome. And then they finally bring you in and they're like, oh, by the way, it's $120,000. And because you already told me this is something you want to know, let, you want to own, let's sign on the dotted line. And you're like, I, I was definitely not prepared for that. Let me take a moment and think about it. Okay, so we can all imagine ourselves in that situation. So why are we thinking our clients are going to be any different when we unveil? Unveil like the most amazing magic trick that you have ever seen and say, listen, customer, I'm going to show you the, the, the proposal. I'm going to hide the price. And then I'm going to unveil the price. Like it is the most amazing magic trick you have ever seen. And the client's like, wow, that is so incredible. Yes, of course I'm going to buy. I don't know why sales teaches you this because that is like the worst thing in the world. I have yet to ever have somebody who's like, whoa, the price is so amazing. I need to buy right now. That is never, ever, ever the case. The proposal, nothing new should ever be presented. Don't ever present a proposal without setting your client's expectations on the price. If you have questions about that, contact us. We're happy to answer that for you. Fatal error number four, talking more than listening. Okay. Let's be honest here. We are all going through something unprecedented. We are all going through something completely unique. And overnight, between February 15th and March 15th, priorities shifted overnight. In my business, I know as the business owner, we were talking about, okay, here's the investments we want to make. Here's the goals we have for ourselves. Here's what we want to do. Boom, 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 boom. Here's our 90 day plan. Ha 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 90 day plan. Because when March 15th came around overnight, everything completely shifted. Your clients are no different. Overnight, their priorities shifted and they probably had to take a look really quickly. They did some type of contingency plan, some type of emergency planning. They did that. They got through it March 30th, April 15th. Okay, this isn't going away. May 15th. Oh, okay. Well, business needs to keep going. So what are we going to do? Priority shifted really fast. And let's say, let's assume that you were one of the lucky ones and you were in a sales conversation very early on with your client. And we wanted to, uh, we, we wanted to just continue on having that conversation with them. All of a sudden they're like, well, no, we need to wait. Oh, of course they need to wait. Things changed. Things changed really fast. And so we want to go back to them and ask them more questions. Pull yourself back into your sales cycle. This is not a linear thing. This is a cycle. It is a turning thing. We want to bring ourselves back, ask more questions, find out more about them. Let them know that you're here to listen. If you're spending all your time talking to them, then they're gonna, their eyes are going to glaze over and they're like, you don't get it. You don't get how much our business has changed. Ask a lot of questions. Be the one who is going to completely surprise your clients because you have prepared the questions you want to ask them. Your clients want to create a solution with you. They want to feel like they had been involved in the solution and that yes, it may be cookie cutter, but they had their say and that you got to understand their business. No client 
wants to feel like you had the solution and you're just trying to get the square hole in the round peg. You're like, let's just take the square hole. Let's put that round peg in there. We're going to fit you in. We're going to fit you in. No, I want to know that you are creating this with us. Now, the nice thing when you even get to proposal is that the proposal is allowed to be collaborative. I'm probably one of the only salespeople that actually will ever say this, right? A lot of sales, sales leaders, sales training will say, your proposal should be presented and it should be presented in this way. I am the, the reigning person. This is how we'll present it. No, nobody wants to do that. We want to feel like we're part of the conversation. And if you don't believe me, the old philosophers from the very beginnings of time so that we have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as often as we speak. Listen twice as often as we speak. This is, this is really about, you know, making sure that you are there. If, you're, if your client graces you for that hour, set your alarm for 30 minutes, 45 minutes and spend that first 45 minutes asking your clients lots of questions. Get them to talk and them to talk. They will feel like you are the only ones that truly get them because you have allowed them the space to talk. There's an old saying that if you don't like the answer, you should have asked a better question. Your job as business leaders, as sales leaders, sales professionals, entrepreneurs, whatever your role is, is to prepare really good questions for your sales process. Open-ended questions are actually more powerful than closed-ended questions. Now, I'm not going to get into why, you know, there's, there's some sales trainings out there that will have five or six or eight different levels of questions. <laughs> Garbage. Let's go with simple and simple is better. There's two levels of questions, in my opinion. There's open-ended questions and there's closed-ended questions. And open-ended questions start with who, what, where, when, how, or why right? Who, what, where, when, how, or why? This is eighth grade English class, right? This is like, tell me a story and explain to me who, what, where, when, how, or why. And when we ask our clients questions that start with those types of words, the client is forced to give us information. They are forced to provide us a statement. Whereas when we ask closed-ended questions, which are typically your are you, could you, should you, have you, would you, do you, those are closed-ended questions. And they will typically be able to be responded with a yes or no. Too many of us are used to asking closed-ended questions as part of the discovery process. Now, closed-ended questions are not bad, but they need to be used strategically. When I'm specifically only looking for a yes or no answer, then I want to ask you a closed-ended question. But in the beginning stages, I need information. I need to know how this is going to impact you. Who else is going to be involved in this decision? When do you need to see this solution finish? What would you want to see as the result of this investment? Um, what, what would happen if you choose to not take any action for the next 60 days? Those all allow the client to say, yes, this is how, this is how. Whereas if I ask you, are you the decision maker? Do you have budget to spend this year? Um, you know, do you want to make a decision before the end of August? And, um, you know, is this a priority for you? And you're like, yes, yes, no, yes. And I'm like, awesome. I'm so glad you gave me those three yeses and a no, because I happen to also be a BuzzFeed questionnaire, and this is the perfect solution for you. Premium service providers are not BuzzFeed questionnaires, okay? Let's be honest here. We are discovery. We're, we are scientists. We are detectives. We have to uncover a ton of information, and just because we get the first piece of information doesn't mean that it's all the information that we need. We have to continue to pull it and find out more and more from the client. We practice more, practice more questions with yourself, with your colleagues. If you are a leader of a team, I want you to, my next Monday morning meeting, start practicing questions and do role play. And if you're looking for people to role play with, I'm going to give you an opportunity to role play with our team. We actually do free meetups every two weeks with people. Um, with, it's an open forum and you can go ahead and start role playing this. Get used to asking questions, hearing responses, pulling that discovery string. We're here to help. Because the other thing is that the person that asks the questions owns the conversation. 
They own the conversation. It is not the person that tells you all the information. It is the person that asks the questions. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to under, uncover information. And then you're going to give me and I'm going to ask you another question. Those questions are going to lead us down a very specific path. Think of this like lawyers. Is the person who's in control of the trial, the person who is st sitting in, in, the, in the, um, the, the prosecutor's box, or is it the person that is asking the question, the lawyer? It's the lawyer. The lawyer is defining the story. The picture is getting the information. They're the ones who are asking the questions. You, in this case, are the lawyer. Ask really valuable questions. Fatal error number five, assuming. Okay, so having the right solution is really meaningless if the, the client isn't bought in. We should not assume that because somebody has a specific title that they are the decision maker. Because their title says vice president or director that they are the ultimate decision maker and they're the only ones going to make a decision. In so many businesses that I have seen, yes, that might be the ultimate person that is stamping the, the check that is the person that is signing the contract, but that does not mean they're the only ones that are making the decision. They might get information from an influencer. That influencer is going to have say in a decision. We'll see too many people that will assume, well, that's just a small company. They're not going to buy a lot. Um, every company, here's the other one I've, I'm seeing a lot. People are assuming every company is looking to reduce their costs. Do not assume that every company is looking to reduce your costs. Nobody wants to hear from me. Do not assume that nobody wants to hear from you. There are a lot of companies out there that are wanting to invest. Do not put barriers into your sales cycle that do not exist. Do not assume assume that there is, there is barriers that are there, that the people that you're meeting aren't going to make a decision, that everyone is wanting to save money, that nobody wants to meet with you over the summer. The summer is so slow, so we're not going to meet with our clients. Do not assume that. Too, too many of the sales cycles are actually stopped, not because of the client, but because of the person who is in control of that sales cycle, you. I see too many business owners, sales people, sales leaders that will hinder their own sales process because they've assumed. Confidence is something we gain through experience. And the more we practice and the more we support and the more you have a tribe behind you saying, yes, you can do it, the easier it will get. Don't assume. Number six, answering objections. We always want to get the information from the client when they give us an objection. As we move through the sales process, and here's the thing, most objections are actually kind of come at the very beginning, usually in the, the first phone call, the first email, right? That's actually majority of the objections. But later on, we'll continue on through the process and the client is going to start to give us objections. Well, you know, what are, what are some of the prices? Can you do it for this type of prop package? Um, are you able to provide us an annual program? Can you do payment solutions? Da, 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 da. They start to provide us a whole bunch of different things because in the back of their minds, the, the thought process process is happening. They're talking to a lot of people and there's a lot of things that are going on. And typically what we do, because we are now at this point for whatever reason, we are scared to lose the deal. Yes, absolutely. Yes, we can do this. Absolutely. Yes, we can make it in green. We don't make it in green, but we can definitely do it. And we will just answer these objections because we just want to seem like we are accommodating. <sighs> Slow down. Slow down, my friend, because oftentimes what the objection actually is, is the client is really asking, if something happens, will you be able to work with us? Will you be there for me? The reasons why they're asking for different solutions, different payment strategies, pricing discounts, everything, is because they've created some type of world for themselves, and it needs to fit within that world. And anything that doesn't fit there needs an alternative solution. And so we want to find out from our clients, if something happens, will you be there for me, is a wonderful way of interacting with our clients. Let's let them know that we will be. Number seven, proposals as contracts. Okay. So if you remember when I showed you that sales cycle, there was a very specific, I said, take a look at that proposal section. The proposal 
had a very specific so section in the sales cycle. The proposal is not a contract. It is not a scope of work. It is not a letter of intention. It is not any of those things. In a romantic relationship, we do not confuse the proposal with the prenup, with the marriage certificate, with the, uh, you know, the, the uh, tax forms or anything else that we try to provide our client. None of that exists. The proposal has a very specific time and place. The other thing about proposals is people try to put a ton of information into a proposal. They try to fit 54 pages of information into a proposal thinking that this is what they need. No. The client's proposal should be a simple, yes, we're ready to move forward or no, we still need more information. The proposal is simple. We focus on this six slide proposal. Uh, three weeks ago, we did the, the uh, webinar on the six slide proposal. If you missed it, you can go and find it in one of our links. Um, send me a message. Also, I can also just send you the, the link as well. There's a slide deck and what you should include in your proposal. But simply your six slide proposal will include the slides of goals, current state, ideal state, solution, timeline, investment. If you have to put more information in there, I challenge you, do you have to? Do you have to? How can you simply convey the information you need to in those six slides? Simple is better. Anything that you feel like you absolutely need to put in there, I challenge you to see if you can provide it as a talking point as opposed to a written point. Simple is always better. Because when we think about simplicity, when we think about what we need to convey in a proposal, the difference between it is how airlines sell vacation packages. When an airline sells you a vacation package, right, they first of all focus on what your goal is, right? Where do you want to be? I want to be on a beach. Great. We have beaches. Where are you currently? Well, currently I am in Chicago in the middle of February. I'm not just in Chicago. I'm in Chicago. And you're in a time and a place place. And by not moving outside of that time and the place, things will get really worse. If I'm in Chicago in the middle of February, it is cold. It is blustery. It is snowpocalypse. What is your ideal state? Really, I, I would love to be on a beach, but I am okay with anything warmer than here. I need to be able to do it efficiently, um, timely, and as soon as I can. Great. The solution is we have a vacation for you, an all-inclusive for seven days. How amazing is that? The timeline is that we can get you there. In, all you have to do is book and we will get you there. And the investment is this price. Now, when the airline focuses you on that, and usually in a 30-second commercial is where they'll, they'll do their proposal. They do this as a 30-second commercial. They focus you on the person who is in the blustery cold. They focus that same person now on the beach. And she's so much more happy. Oh, she's exchanged the parka for a bikini. She's got rid of the snow covered streets for the white sand beaches. And life is blissful. And when we think about what that airline sells, go ahead and put it in the chat. What do you think that airline sells? When they're selling you that vacation package and they're focusing you on that beach, on how amazing it will be, what are they selling you? What is it? Because if right now sucks and where you want to be is blissful, what they sell you should be something in between. Debbie has put in here, yeah, it might be the experience. I get people that will tell me happiness. I will have people say, well, you know, it will be an experience. It's a vacation. It's a getaway. It's bliss. No, all of that is wrong. Because what the, what the airline actually sells is a seat on a plane. And if they focus the 30 seconds entirely on how small your seat is and how they have a 24 point now COVID relief, you know, uh, virus protection and everything. And we're going to fly for you for 30,000 feet in the air for six and a half, half hours with recycled air. People still would have a really hard time getting on a plane. Because it's not, that's not what we're buying. What we're buying is the vacation. The reality is the moment you get off at that airport, the airline wipes their hands clean and says, thank you so much for flying with us. There is your, your shuttle to get you to your all-inclusive vacation. 
They have no determination about, they don't care how you get to your vacation destination. All they're happy to do is to get you safely to that destination airport. And if you're in your sales process, if one of the reasons you're struggling in your proposal specifically with trying to define how do I, how do I simplify my solution down to one slide, it's because typically you will focus entirely about how you are flying a plane what that flight is going to look like and not where you are going to help get your client to. And chances are you might also be struggling with the logic of it. Because here's the thing is decisions are based on emotion and then justified with logic. People need to be personally motivated. Now, I promise you, I promise you just because you are going to be able to save your client money, it will sometimes still not be enough for them to want to invest. Just because you are saving your client so many hours in a week, it will still not be enough for them to want to invest. So what is it? What is that missing piece? When I worked for Xerox, I remember we had this gentleman come in and he taught us how to create these ironclad proposals. And he says, and we would take, you know, the hourly savings of, you know, printing off some type of report times some type of hourly wage and to do, 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 do. And you can show your clients how every single time you can save them money. And every single time your client is going to say yes. And my financial brain was on fire. I said, oh my goodness, this is incredible. This is amazing. And I couldn't wait to present my first proposal to my my client. And I asked all the questions. I asked them, how long is this currently taking you? How much money are you currently spending? How much do you need to save in order to say yes? And the client answered all these questions. And I went ahead and I created this proposal for the client. And I said, listen, we're going to be able to save you $3,000 every single quarter. Isn't that incredible? And the client said, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I see how you did your numbers there. I, yeah, definitely. I, I can see that we, uh, we need to get back to you. We need to think about it. Are, are you kidding? What, what do you need to think about? Like, what are you stupid? Like we're saving you $3,000 a quarter. Like this is logic here. The missing piece in this decision was that it wasn't enough for this person to want to change their entire process. Why would I go through the pain of changing one process for another? Yes, I could save money, but what am I going to do with that savings? How am I going to take that savings and do more with my company? Is it worth it? In the sales process, in the sales questions, we need to find out how are we going to help our clients achieve more. Time savings and money savings are just not enough anymore for our clients. We need to get into something deeper. What more do they want? Is it more clients? Is it more revenue? And what would that more do? Is it going to allow them to expand their business? Is it going to allow them to expand their offerings, their geographies, help even more businesses that they are trying to serve? And how would that make them feel? Because we need to tap in more into the emotional intelligence of every single person that is making these decisions. We're not dealing with logical businesses. We're dealing with illogical, irrational people. And my feelings are what really matter. How do I feel about this? The quickest way to start tapping into those emotional charges, help your clients to feel better, is by simply changing the way we approach our clients. How are you feeling today? How do you feel about that? And if you had to make this decision today, what would your gut say? Yeah, Debbie says EQ is the new IQ. It absolutely is. It's actually, they're showing now, research is showing that EQ is proving a level of success now, higher um, in, in sales, in, um, in late leaders, department leaders, CEOs than IQ. Remember this, people buy on emotion and then justify with logic. Get your clients to be emotionally charged with you. Get, get to find out what would make them excited. What do they want? What are those goals and aspirations? What is that vision they have for their company? Why is that so important? Watch the smile grow on their face. And then we can justify their decisions later on with logic.
And for those of you that don't believe me, I, I want to bring up this specific quote in particular because Cameron is an engineer. And the first time I told him about this, he told me, Kim, engineers don't have feelings. This won't work for us because engineers don't have feelings. And immediately after I said, Cameron, just try it out. And immediately after he called me up and he, he actually wrote me an email. He said, I made a second call. The first call, it actually worked. But he's like, I just made another call and had to let you know. That client moved the discussion from about a five to a nine out of 10, simply because we just made it more personal. We connected on a more personal level. If you're sitting on a few sales cycles that are maybe sitting at a four and five and sixes out of 10, I want you to get in contact with us so we can help get you even more clear on how you can make it more personal and be like Cameron and move it to that nine and 10. Okay, fatal error number nine. I'm wrapping up and then I have a couple of minutes for questions here. Once it's done, once the contract is signed. <laughs> Let's be honest. If your sales process does not include how are you getting more referrals and testimonials, you are failing all your future sales. 30% of your new revenue should somehow be attributed to previous clients, whether that is previous clients um, ex uh, supporting your business, giving you referrals or testimonials, or 30% of your clients buying more from you. But 89% of deals will close when they start from a referral. Your referrals need to be built into your sales process. And it doesn't mean that you have to wait until the entire process is delivered. You do not have to wait until your entire service has been delivered. Majority of your clients are actually willing and, and happy to provide you a referral before you have completed the service offering for them. They will even be happy to refer you before they have even accepted day one of delivery because they have enjoyed the process that you have in. Listen, if you have enjoyed this process, would you be willing to support us? Like, is there, who else in your network would love to have a sales strategy session, would love to have a uh, digital marketing consultation, would love to have a HR assessment? Oh, well, that would be this person or this person. Fantastic. Would you be so kind as to putting us in touch via email? I would love to leverage the work that you've already done. Okay, hey, here's the true story. So I told you about the digital marketing agency. Here's what they ended up doing. They weren't sure if the right time was to invest. They're like, listen, we've lost 80% of our revenues. We don't know if right now is the right time to invest. Yet we said, listen, just try it out. If it doesn't work, if something happens and you are unable to make your monthly payment, let us know. We're happy to work with you because I can guarantee this will transform your business. And they said, okay, we're putting our faith in you, Kim. And they started the program at the end of April. And before they graduated, so it's a three-month program, April, May, June. Before they graduated, they closed two new deals that weren't even on their radar before. We worked with them step by step through that entire sales process. We encouraged them, we provided them accountability. They had a team and a tribe of collective students working with them that were also supporting them. They got really clear on that ideal client that they were working with. And currently, I talked to them just this morning as I was making some last minute edits. They told me that they're working on the biggest deal that they will ever close. They said, we're actually giving our proposal to the client next Wednesday. And this will be the biggest deal that we've ever, during COVID. There are deals to be had out there. I want to help you get more deals, bigger deals than ever before. And the last thing they said before we got off the phone this morning was we couldn't have done this without you. Doug McKay also had the same experience when he finalized a six-figure deal and the client ended up countering by offering him more money. Doug, you've done such amazing work for us, they said. Would you be willing to take on this additional project and we'll even pay you more? He says in one single sales cycle, he closed two deals. We have programs that will fit for whatever you're looking for. We have instructor-led, we have self-study. 
We have low monthly payment plans that are fair and reasonable no, no matter what you are looking for. And all of them include a year of coaching support. You can check out our online or self-study program at kimorleski.com slash ko dash online. What Nabil said was that we truly undervalued the course for the value he received. He said this in week six, halfway through our 12 week program. He's like, I, he's like, had I known I was going to get this, he's like, I would have paid way more. He's like, I was so nervous the first time I had to put that payment down. He's like, but by far, this was the best thing I've ever spent. But if you're not in a position to invest right now, I want you to know that help is still on the way. I want you to book a sales strategy session with my team. You can go to bit.ly slash KO meeting. Go to that link and it will actually book a time that is most convenient for your calendar. We're going to give you a sales strategy session. Once you book it, you are also going to get my book, Sell More Faster for Free. And to additionally give you support, that month of group coaching that we have, we're going to give you a full month for free. You will be signed up and you are going to participate in our group coaching sessions. And you don't even, there is no commitment to buy beyond that. We truly want to help you get better at your sales conversations, better at that questions, get the confidence you need to reach out to clients, get those proposals even better. And if you don't believe me, listen to Rob Crooks, because he says the longer you wait, that's revenue you're missing out on. Are you in a position to miss out on even more revenue. I want to leave you with this final thought because some people tell me that this is too good to be true. The reason why we do this, if LinkedIn calls me their most influential sales leader to follow, Zig Ziglar is my most influential sales leader to follow. And he says, you can have everything you want in life if you help enough people get what they want. That is it. That, like, that is our whole mandate. We want to see more business owners succeed. We want to see more sales people succeed because sales is the process of connecting with more people. And if we can connect with you and we can help you, we've truly done our job. We've done what we've set out to do. So I'm going to leave you with this question. What is one thing you are going to do differently today? I am honored. I am blessed. I know that you had other things that you could have done with this hour of your time. I know that to ask you to spend an hour with me is a lot. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. I hope this was valuable for you. Was this valuable? I mean, please let me know in the chat. And if it wasn't, let me know that too. I want to continue to get better and better. I also want to know what is one thing you are going to do differently. One thing you took, I gave you a lot of information today. Next week, we're having another um, webinar Wednesday. I believe the topic is on prospecting. Different ways that you can prospect, specifically in online in an, and in offline communities. I hope you will join us. Don't forget to follow us on our KO Advantage page connect with us. We have a limited number of, um, of sessions available to you for those, those sales strategy sessions, as well as the free book, a month of free coaching. We can't offer this to everyone. So once those spots are taken, they are taken. Thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Jay. Thank you everyone else for joining me today. I truly appreciate this. Go have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon. Goodbye.